Yeah. Let's start taking our jack from Did you push it? Yeah, it's good. Yep. will be the men's Bible study. And uh, just as a reminder, the early service will be at 9 o'clock, followed by a breakfast, and then we'll have the morning service, which will be a service slash the... Uh, I don't know, let's read our verses together. Ephesians 1-3. Blessed, blessed be the, be the God, God and Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, blessings in heavenly, heavenly places, places in Christ. Christ. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And be kind one to another, tender heart, forgiving one another, even, Even as, as God, God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven, forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. children. Put and on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. devil. All right, let's take our hymn books and we'll stand together and sing glory to his name. <laughs>
turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Just read a couple of verses for you, ones that we've read before, but in our continuing study of the armor. Uh, Ephesians 6, starting with verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And we'll stop right there. I want, I want to provide that up. May God bless us as we read this section of scripture as we continue on in our study of Ephesians chapter 6. As we go to prayer this morning, continue to pray for Matt and Mary, and uh, um, especially pray for Mary as she's uh, dealing with this pain and uh, lack of appetite, loss of weight, and all of these things kind of culminating into um, maybe a slight bit of depression. Uh, pray for uh, Heath and Elaine as well. Pray for Sammy, that he'd be a good boy. Amen. <laughs> he wants to stand up here with me. Yeah, that's normal. All right, let's pray for uh, Dylan. Dylan uh, contacted me and uh, again was asked to go to a uh, hoedown in Texas. I guess it's a country western thing. He asked me my opinion and uh, I, I gave it to him, you know, whether he should go or not. Uh, his friends go to meet girls. <laughs> Which is a good thing, you know, instead of being boys. But, um, <laughs> he, uh, I told him, if you can go and feel that God is being glorified through it, then go. Otherwise, maybe you should forego it. And so I let him bet. You know, he has to make up his own decisions. Uh, so pray for Dylan because he wants to do what's right. Uh, but he wants to do what I tell him. And I say, you've got to do what the Bible says, not what the pastor says. You know, because I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you know if you're asking me, you're already questioning whether it's something good for him or not. So, pray for him. Very sensitive boy, and, uh, you know, so, anyway, it's, uh, it's a good, good opportunity for us to, to bond together, I guess. And uh, Let's continue to pray for, um, uh, well, pray for Mary's family. Uh, they got news that uh, Megan and her husband are moving to South Carolina. And they're selling their apartment and uh, having a house built down there, so they're moving away. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Anybody have a prayer request? I guess Sammy didn't make it. <laughs> All right. Um, Louise, you had a prayer request last week. Did that um, something with uh, my nephew? Yeah, Danny. Yeah, everything's about the same. same. So okay. she, uh, right. he had a couple close calls this week. Um, you can pray for uh, Mary's other family, or sister, daughter Susan, and her husband and Trevor, Travis, uh, because um, uh, I guess they're having some problems. Uh, Travis is being bullied in school, and uh, other things. And plus. Uh, his, uh, Susan's husband's parents are here in Kings Park at a nursing home, and the mother wants to go home. She, they thought she had Alzheimer's, but she seems to be right as rain now, and wants to go back to her home where she lived, and so they don't know what to do. So, uh, pray for our government, of course, and our country, and all the believers and people in Ukraine, and uh, all the different things that are going on in the world. And, you know, so, all right, let's pray to Father, thank you for this time. We're, we're, we're praying, Father, with uh, faith, Lord, that you would just direct our steps. Uh, we know, Father, that your word is true and applicable in every situation. We pray, Father, for uh, folks on our list that are uh, having difficulties physically, that Mary, of course, uh, Keith and Elaine, uh, Louise and Art, bless them and 
pray for their uh, selling of their house, but you will, of course, and we pray, Father, for the family member there as well, Danny. We pray for Mary's family uh, as the, the one daughter moves to South Carolina, and pray for Susan and the family as they deal with um, difficulties in their life as well. Pray for uh, Dylan that uh, he might maintain his testimony and grow as he uh, serves the Lord down there, Father, and that you would just uh, keep him uh, safe from uh, the, all the difficulties that he faces in, in a big university. And uh, we pray for the time that we have together and the moments that we spend in your word, Father, that your, uh, your word would penetrate our hearts, that we might uh, grow closer to you, uh, grow more encouraged to trust you, Father, and we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. We'll sing another hymn together, I Need the Every Hour, 167. Do you think we should have told him about the rocks? 
Faith is a, a curious thing. Man today claims to have faith. Obviously, they place their trust in man themselves. They trust in gravity and things that God has created for us. And that element, the, the idea or the definition of faith is something that they have construed over the centuries and basically have come with a definition that isn't necessarily biblical. When we look at the Bible, we find that Hebrews tells us, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. Matter of fact, it gives us a definition of faith in the book of Hebrews that talks about things hoped for, not seen. And so faith is not a leap in the dark, but a deep willingness to trust God at his value. Uh, so it's a kind of a funny definition, but I think it's something that we have to really kind of consider. When you put on the uh, armament, here we find we have the loins girded with truth. We kind of understand the idea that in the first century, the Roman soldiers wore some kind of belt that uh, was able to gather all of his loose ends from his robe, tuck them in so that he has mobility and uh, less things to get in the way. So the idea of uh, this total commitment to serving God looks like this truth of belt, this uh, idea of absolute truth that gives us this center. And uh, uh, Paul uses this metaphor to try to help us to make this uh, transition from these uh, pieces of equipment that we see and then think of it in a spiritual way. So for the believer to have any success in uh thwarting Satan's uh, tax and standing for God, he has to be really kind of um, balanced and helped by God's truth. And then the breastplate is connected to this belt, and we find ourselves obeying God's word. So this is that righteousness, this uh, breastplate of righteousness, as we totally obey God's word in faith. And then we have the shoes, the... Um, shot on our feet and the preparation of the gospel, we understand that that gives us the ability to stand on ground that God has given us. And then, of course, there's the option of mobility as well, because we're prepared for the gospel of peace. Um, we have this sense of knowing that God's in complete control, that underlying peace that gives us stability. Now, uh, Paul goes on and says, above all, now, you can make a big deal out of that phrase, meaning that the shield of faith seemingly is something that might be a little more important, but I'm not sure exactly if that's the case. What he's trying to do now is to uh, tie these three elements together, connected with the shield of faith that God gives us. Now, in the first century, the shield and uh, you know, it's easy enough to see in Scripture that the word for shield is the type of shield that looks kind of like a door. Matter of fact, they it's referred to like a door. And the shield could also be a stretcher to carry the man's body that didn't make it. But these shields were designed to protect the whole body. Matter of fact, they were about six feet by four feet. And that's an approximation, obviously. And there was a little hook that they could hook it onto the belt. And these shields were designed that if soldiers were in some type of ambush, they could hook their shields together and give them this kind of protection all the way around. And so in the analogy of the shield, what we're finding here in the Bible is that um, it says, above all, taking this shield of faith. Now I wanted to stop and remind you even though it says this is the Christian armor, this is God's armor he provides for us. Nowhere is there any evidence to say that we are, we are the manufacturers of this armor, but God has provided truth for us. God has provided us an opportunity for application of truth in righteousness. This practical obedience to God's word gives us the stability to stand and resist and now he provides this total protection from the fiery darts. In the first century, they would make these shields out of leather and then sometimes soak them in water because the 
uh, archers, a lot of times, they had three types of arrows. One was a regular arrow. The other one was a fiery arrow. Then they had this other arrow that went on impact would spread uh, burning tar. Almost looked like a missile that exploded. It would spread this. So if the uh, soldier was hit in the shield, the water and the thickness of the leather would protect them from this fiery dart. So those are the three kinds of darts that are used. And uh, so this shield was prepared especially to protect the soldier. So obviously in Paul's in thinking and sharing this, obviously uh, prepared by the Holy Spirit, and I won't say obviously again, maybe I will one more time, but <laughs> it's not necessarily obviously a lot of people anyway, that's my third time. So I had to do that, that's a part of the makeup here. But what we're looking for is protection. And uh, no guarantee that you wouldn't get wounded, but you would survive to be able to fight. Um, in the military, a wounded soldier is not the same as a dead soldier. That's why they had combat medics, to try to get the guy back on his feet if possible. Uh, and you, moan, you may know someone that is a believer who has been hit. And so you gotta make this uh, transition, because sometimes, uh, there are believers that have uh, got hit by these missiles and have become wounded and uh, are damaged, uh, but are still able to serve in some way. And uh, it's not our part to judge them because of the damage that they have incurred in the past. Um, they're down, they're wounded, they're suffering. What we uh, do now is not kick them in the side with guilt over how bad they were, but to relish and celebrate that God has wonderfully forgiven them if a believer has fallen and then has repented and has been restored by God. Um, it's very easy to become or to want to isolate from some that might have been dragged through the coals a few times and then appear in church. And they might look differently, might talk differently, might have different backgrounds, might have experienced things that most believers haven't, but they are wonderfully saved now. That's the thing that we have to remember, that if that person has become a believer, his sins have been paid for. We sometimes uh, rate our sins, well, I wasn't as bad as so-and-so, but the Bible kind of declares uh, one sin guilty of them all in God's eyes. So there's an equal playing field. All are lost in their sins until the God draws them and they come to Christ. And uh, so uh, we are a church that uh, can be filled with broken people. And uh, I don't think there's such a church that is in existence that doesn't have someone that doesn't have some uh, wounds from war, warfare with, it, the, with Satan, obviously. I, you have to be very careful when you're playing this uh, analogy and going back and forth. So there's no real misunderstanding. Uh, we're not talking about real armor. Oh, that would be a cool thing. If you want to wear some kind of uh, supernatural clothing, you got to be a Mormon, and they have some kind of underwear. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work too well. Uh, but uh, they still wear long john underwear with special emblems on it. They might not admit it to you, but if you ever have a Mormon come to your house, say, I'm not going to talk to you until I see this underwear. And see what happens. I've never had the fortitude to do so, but um, we haven't had that many Mormons around here. We used to have some Joe Witnesses to come, but they kind of gave up on us. But anyway, let's talk about this for a few. Um, let me give you the approximation, because I kind of took this off my head. I'm not sure exactly what I told you, but the Roman shield was about two by four, two feet by four feet. And I, I've, I've heard of larger shields as well, but that was the, the natural size of it. First John chapter 5 says, For who, what's, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, uh, evidence of things not seen. That's not the whole verse. I just kind of typed out what I wanted. But uh, if you look at the Hebrew 11, it's pretty close to that. Daily faith for the believer is the assurance that God is with us, his word is true. 
it's our reliance and confidence and the basis of our faith must always be connected with the Word of God. But we can't pick and choose which parts of the Bible we believe, uh, you know, the uh, cafeteria-style Christian would like. The New Testament, where it says God is love, but kind of shrivels back from the Old Testament of God, where God said, you know, wipe out this group of people. Um, that's really, there's no room for that, obviously. Uh, we take the Bible at face value that Genesis 1 to the last verse of Revelation and anything between that is inspired. The Holy Spirit is God's word. So let's talk about this shield of faith in this concept of uh, making it work for us today. What I would propose is first, daily faith is rooted in fact, not feeling. So you ever feel bad? Feel like you don't care? Feel like, oh, what's the point? <coughs> Um, and that, that can be an interference in your walk because what we have to do is rely on God's truth, not how we feel. Sometimes I feel elated. Sometimes I feel deflated. And I don't want to do anything except maybe eat. You know, that never seems to be a problem for me. <laughs> you think I would not want to, you know, well, anyway. So daily faith is rooted in fact, not feeling. It's not about emotions and inner impressions. I just have faith this is going to work. God wasn't in it, and they said, maybe I didn't have enough faith. The problem a lot of times wasn't in the amount of their faith, but in the object of their faith. Just because you get two guys together and say, we think this is God's will, might not necessarily be so, especially if it's contrary to the word of God. Um, sometimes little kids will run out on Farmer Giles Pond um, and uh, sometimes they get a surprise. Sometimes it ends in tragedy. The problem isn't in their faith. They had a lot of faith. Too much, actually. The problem was in the basis of their faith. They placed their faith in the wrong object. Do um, you get that? They weren't placing their faith in the reality of the thickness of the ice, but in the hope of having fun ice skating. I, I didn't think that would pour too well I'm looking at your eyes and you're trying to think. <laughs> uh, okay, I get that. We had a guy on our hockey team. His name was Larry Spaziano. He was a big Italian guy. He was as tall as he was wide. And every early spring, every early uh, season of hockey, we'd wait for Larry to skate out on the ice. And if he came back, we knew that the pond was safe. <laughs> and he understood that. We'd all be on the shore waiting for Larry to go out and see if it's safe, you know. And um, yeah, it's a funny story. And he was a nice guy, too. Uh, I was a younger kid playing hockey with college age kids, and I'd get pushed around sometimes. And he'd always kind of back me up, you know. The, the big college kid wanted to knock me over, and all of a sudden you'd see a shadow behind him. That was Larry. So Larry kind of kept me safe. And, uh, but uh, the idea of placing our faith in things uh, can be misdirecting and misunderstood. Uh, you place your faith in yourself, in your man, uh, your mankind, uh, things will go wrong. There were three men walking on a wall, feeling faith and fact. When feeling took an awful fall and faith was taken back, so close was faith to feeling, he stumbled and fell too. But fact remained and pulled faith back, and faith brought feeling too. That's not, no one wants to take credit for who wrote that, but you've got to think about it for a second, but it makes a lot of sense. Faith is nothing to do with probability. You know, there's a, always a, a person with statistics, and there's a good chance it's going to rain. Matt and I always have a chuckle on Monday because we always discuss the weather and how wrong they are, you know. Uh, my friend at the golf course lost, he said, $3,000 last Saturday because of the weatherman. The weatherman said it was going to be rainy, and so people did other things and didn't reserve a tea time, and then when Saturday came, it was sunny, and so there wasn't anybody there. Uh, so uh, placing your faith in things that aren't consistent or absolute like God, it will always be a mistake. So uh, George Mueller said this, the process of faith begins where probabilities cease. It is not 
probable that a little shepherd boy could kill a giant with a slingshot. Probability says no, but faith says yes. Um, there were a bunch of untrained Jews who um, could see a wall fall by walking around it. That rain would never come and Noah needed a boat. Man could survive in the den of lions. And the Bible is filled with examples of uh, the idea of probability being thrown out the window. When we trust God's word and man says boo-hoo, we maintain our relationship with God by trusting it. And uh, uh, I think I said this this morning in Sunday school class that all of man's wisdom is foolishness to God. Man will tell you that we've evolved and God's word says, no, I created you. And I had a conversation with a fellow the other day. He was trying to tell me how to lose weight. And he says, man has evolved over a thousand years. I said, let's stop right there. We did not evolve. God created us, male and female, period. And he took him back for a second, and then he kind of readjusted his thing, he went on with his little story. But uh, that's an opportunity for us as believers because this man contradicted absolute truth. And I feel it's our obligation to correct people by telling them this absolute truth and where we got it from. Because this is our opportunity to share to uh, non-believers. There is an opportunity for them to have a consistency in life. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the dark night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars high. Doubt questions who believe. Faith answers I. And so we have these quaint little things that I found. They're not from the Reader's Digest. I'm not um, Met Methodist, but um, I listened to a Methodist guy and then went back and looked up November 98, and his message was right there in the Reader's Digest. It was pretty good, but, you know, I wouldn't stoop that low, but this idea of trying to understand what faith is, you have to kind of put yourself in a place where you look at God and say, I can believe God 100% of the time. I will rather choose to believe God than anything else. If you can get to that point where you choose God over anything that man portrays, you're on the right track to trusting God. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 7, please. I can read this for you. i get my uh, computer to go here. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new love. You're in the as, wrong place. What? You're in the wrong place. That's why the second Corinthians. I'm sorry. I, you know, sometimes we try, well, I'm going to try to make it work. I must have picked the verse for a reason. But thank you, Margaret. Now, this will make more sense to you. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Oh, I could have made that work. Somehow. Walk by faith, not by sight. Live by faith, not by sight. Uh, breathe by faith, not by sight. Answer your uh, questions that people give you by faith, not by sight. And uh, this concept of allowing God's word to uh, envelop our understanding and so that when we begin to share the truth, it's always God's word will be in the right direction, uh, gives us confidence. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing, rather to be absent from the body of the presence of the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be acceptable unto him. The idea, everything that we say, do, and think, glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ, and always uh, sticking to the word of God is the right avenue to take. Uh, at the end of World War II, the Allied forces were searching abandoned homes and cars. They entered the basement of a house of ruins. A Jew had spent some time. Now, I should have said a Jewish person because I think saying a Jew can be derogatory, or am I wrong? A Jewish person, how about, what do you think? You're a Jewish it depends person. on the context. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
This Jewish person spent some time there, a victim of the Holocaust, scratched into a wall these words. I believe in the sun, even when it does not shine. I believe in love, even when it's not shown. And I believe in God, even when he does not speak. Faith has nothing to do with appearances. It's the evidence of things not seen. Appearance may say that God is nowhere to be found. Faith says he will never leave me nor forsake me. Appearance may sometimes say all things are gone haywire. Faith says even the hairs of my head are numbered by God in his full control. Appearance told the disciples there's no need to fish any longer. We have tried all night in vain. Faith says launch out into the deep because Jesus said so. This is the path that I'm trying to show you. You have as an opportunity as believers. You can walk in faith, trust in God totally. What will happen eventually, you'll be unfazed by the things that happen in the earth because they really don't, really doesn't matter to us. Because the Bible has already told us we've been adopted into God's family. We have been um, uh, born from above. Uh, our home is different place. And so we have the Bible to give us direction and guidance and really prophetically kind of share what we can expect down the road. But when it comes to our relationship, nothing changes. One day, and it's in God's omniscience, uh, a time for Chris Hall to come home. Tick tock, tick tock. I don't know what it is. Do you? God does. So uh, that's one less thing I have to worry about. When I make bread, uh, there are certain elements that have to be put in there. And if you miss it, even though you met well, the bread doesn't come out so well. And it's usually unedible. And so for the believer, all these elements that God's provided for us have a reason. The shield of faith helps us when Satan shoots these darts of doubt, darts of depression, darts of despair. You look around your life and things aren't going well and uh, might not have enough money. Your health might be failing and you start thinking about, is God forsaken me? That's the dart. Now the shield of faith says, not so. I will never forsake you. I'll always provide for you. See, so this, these darts that are absorbed by the shield protects us from these, these darts that are shot at us. Now, don't get lost in this imagery, but in a practical sense, you know, placing this shield of faith is really placing our trust in God's Word and allowing God's Word to have its way so that faith has nothing to do with what's happening. A missionary once was... Uh, taken out of the field because the husband was killed and some of the other missionary men were killed and uh, she got back to the States and I won't give you the details because they're a little fuzzy now with me so I don't want to be wrong but she was asked by someone in church um, are you going back and she said certainly I'm going back it's safer to be in the center of will in the center of God's will than be out of God's will so God allows some of us to go into very difficult situations, but that is his will for us. There's where safety is. Because the outcome of the situation is all in God's hands. So we have it wrong when we think God has blessed us because I've lived a long life and nothing really has happened to me and I'm a dying of old age or whatever. That's not necessarily the right way to look at things. Now, God might have preserved you and allowed you to go through this, we have the Apostle Paul died in old age and the Isle of Patmos, but um, what? John. John, who did I say? Paul. Oh. Here you go, Paul, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so faith, let me just go by. You know, George Mueller, uh, he had an orphanage in England, and uh, he started with two shillings. That's about 50 cents today, I think. He had previously made up his mind that when he need, he would never ask a human being for help, but only God. 
Over the years, those two shillings grew into five massive granite buildings covering 13 acres, capable of accommodating 2,000 orphans. Through prayer alone, Mueller saw $7 million given. More than once, he sat at the table with hungry orphans with a grain, without a grain of food in front of them and blessed the food that God had on the way, and only to be interrupted by a knock on the door. I'm sure you've heard these stories before. They prayed for breakfast, and all of a sudden, you know, a cart with milk broke down. Could you use some milk? And then another one with bread. And we kind of roll our eyes and think, you know, okay, that sounds like a real quaint story, but it's, it's true. You know, sometimes we dismiss the truth because it doesn't seem like it could happen. Remember what I said about probability? In God's case, um, throw that out the window. If there's a need, God will meet it. Sometimes miraculously, sometimes we don't really see it. But later we realize that God has performed a miracle before us. And uh, all of us have experienced that if you know Christ as your Savior. Just to be saved today is a miracle. There are good people out there lost in their sins. No interest in God. Even when you share the gospel and they poo-hoo it, they're, they're pretty good the way they're not that bad. They're open for the best. And here we are standing there with the truth. The wall's just going to go and you're going to get swept away. And it's a frustrating thing, but that's all God's plan. And uh, we're just there being a part of this. You know, it can be kind of frustrating. But anyway, um, this is one of those messages where I kind of plug in some things just to make things a little snappier, right? Just so you understand why I'm doing this. I don't do it all the time. <laughs> There's this guy named Cliff. No, actually, he was hanging off a cliff. So, but you can remember his name is Cliff. And was hanging from a root. Can you picture that now? Hanging from a root. He caught as he was falling. He called out for help. And then all of a sudden he heard a verse saying, I'm here. And the, said the voice, who are you? It said, the Lord. I'll help you. But you have to, let, you have to trust me. Okay. Uh, let go of the root. And there was a pause. And it says, is there anybody else out there? <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of times that's kind of how our faith is. God has already told us this is exactly what he wants. We're looking for loopholes and options. I don't really like to share the gospel, you know, because I have to talk to people I don't like. You know, I remember when I was younger, I used to say, I want a church in Alaska. You know, and so what did God give me a church in Comac? With about as many people as I would get in Alaska. You know, so go figure that. At least it's warmer down here sometimes. This kind of faith, explained, uh, is uh, uh, faith that is lacking in trusting in God. Let's look at uh, faith expanding. How can we make our faith, uh, our shield of faith larger, increase our faith? Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but uh, history tells us that they did maintenance on these shields. And they had leather on it, and they would soak it in water just before the battle and repair whatever was damaged on this thing. And so uh, you can make the case that a lot of times in Scripture, the Holy Spirit was symbolic by oil or water. And so some people have written uh, copious uh, pages of uh, uh, minutia about the Holy Spirit involved in this idea of the shield of faith. And I think you can kind of make it work a little bit to think that, you know, if we're trusting in God, certainly the Holy Spirit's involved in this. Because as we fill our minds with God's Word, that's part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to give us the confidence and encouragement to trust Him, and to guide our feet, to, to show us the way to go. And so, in that case, I think that we can make the case that faith grows gradually. Think about it for a second. When you first came to Christ, you had that element of faith place your faith in Christ, but 20, 30, 40 years later, your faith should be more muscular, more stronger, uh, more, more uh, based in uh, the Word of God. You don't obtain strong faith all at once, any more than an infant becomes an adult all at once. It takes time, proper nutrition, exercise. In Sammy's case, I think they're feeding him a little too much. He's uh, the size of a four-year-old, but he's a two-year-old brain. And uh, would you say he's in the bad twos? Yeah, okay. 
He wants what he wants, and he wants it. I've seen that already. You know, and he fixates on things. My computer, every hour, tells me what time it is. It's 2 o'clock in a kind of robot voice. So he's been kind of fixated on that thing. That plus Alice, our, our uh, computerized vacuum cleaner, you know, he tr he's always traumatized when he comes to Papa's house. But anyway, <laughs> faith grows gradually. Abraham is known for his faith, but if you uh, look at his life, in his early life, he lacked faith. Even in older years, he faltered. He wasn't just born a man of faith. It kind of grew gradually. Uh, Hudson Taylor was a pioneer missionary in China, and, uh, you know, his uh, story started out very small, and uh, it took years and years and years and years and years before he ever saw really any kind of uh, results from his ministry. Uh, number two, faith grows scripturally. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Faith is trust. And the way you come to trust someone is by getting acquainted with them. You trust someone, you know, as an apprentice, and then you help them along the way and give them little bits of responsibility. It's similar, similar to a parent. We don't just hand the keys to the kid. Here, run down to the store, you know. He's only 12, but he might make it. We wouldn't do that, not a good parent. But eventually we trust him enough to let him take the car. Just like... We give our kids chores. That gives them an opportunity to reveal to us that they're maturing and, or learning how to hide, which was my son's thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, some I would trust with money to the bank or with my wife in a car because I have come to know them. And the more we get to know our Lord, we come to know his power, wisdom, justice, love and gentleness, we learn that this is true. Uh, Psalm 9 says, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, need. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hath not forsaken them that seek thee. Romans 8 says, for we know all things work together for good to them that love God. Sometimes we kind of slide over that part. You know, love God, you know, that's something that requires an element of thought. Do I love God? I can say that all day, but do I demonstrate that love of God? Well, how do I do that? Well, I would say the best way to demonstrate the love of God is by obeying his word. And so it comes back down to our obligation, our desire to please him by obeying his word. Uh, faith grows painfully. Paul was a great man of faith. He suffered much for the Lord, and the two things go hand in hand. Uh, Mueller said this, trials, difficulties, obstacles, and bereavements, these are the very food of faith. Little boy could get a puzzle to go together. The last few pieces. He was so frustrated, he asked his little sister to help. Imagine that. In seconds, she had it done. He asked her how. She showed him the front of the box. I looked at the picture. Uh, you were looking at the pieces. It's come by what we do as in life. We're looking at the brokenness of whatever, and we don't step back and look at the bigger picture that God has. You know that the Bible already tells us that we're kind of connected, and God will use one of us in maybe a tragedy to reach someone else for Christ. Or to encourage other believers by virtue of your faith in him. And so uh, we're not alone. We're adopted into a family. And God a lot of times will use other people to help us along the way as well. Uh, so it helps us to see the bigger picture. Read the end of the Bible. We win. We get taken back home. And everything is great. So uh, knowing that helps us in this part of life where things are hard. Anybody wake up this morning without any pain? No? That's interesting. And it doesn't mean that we're all old because we have some young folks here too. Well, one, anyway. Two. Yeah, okay. You, you two. But life is pretty similar, you know? And uh, no matter what you do, Things are winding down for all of us. As we get older, things just change. 
eyesight, ears, teeth, hair, everything kind of goes its way. But the one consistent, constant thing we have is the Word of God. Nothing changes there. Even the part where it says he knows every hair. You could say he knows every hair you've lost as well. You know, I think that rationally fits right into that paradigm that God knows everything about us and knows our very thoughts. Matter of fact, in omniscience, he knows everything we're ever going to think to the day we die. That should give us a lot of comfort to know that God has us so closely in his hands that we don't have to fear anything. Nothing, no matter what happens. Well, life sometimes is like a puzzle. God holds the bigger picture. We hold the shield of faith. When we believe in him for what he, we don't understand, it's, it's not about feelings, probabilities, or appearances. Faith is rooted in fact. It grows gradually, sometimes painfully, but the word of God, but the word of God, uh, more, I believe, uh, will help us. Um, I like the verse in the New Testament, and I'm going to memorize its address, but I, I can see the guy hitting his chest and saying, Lord, help me in my unbelief. You know, uh, do you feel guilty sometimes when you try to think of what God's Word has said and you have a hard time believing it? It happens. You might not necessarily be able to articulate it that way, but doubt is unbelief. Doubt in God's capability of providing. Sometimes we feel that God has failed us because he didn't answer the prayer. And we don't take into consideration his answer was the right answer. Perhaps if he would answer that the way we prayed, it wouldn't have turned out the way we thought it would be. You know, um, people that are dying, sometimes we pray for them, Lord, spare them. You know, but uh, maybe we should ask that person first. If I was dying knowing I'd be with the Savior any moment, I wouldn't want you to say, Lord, take him quickly. You know, painfully maybe, or painlessly. But, uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to be left here any longer than I need to be. Uh, it's not about uh, uh, man making the decision, making the call. It's all about God. If, I was going to, I have a little note. If time permits, we're going to make the transition into the helmet of salvation. But in six minutes, that might not work, other than saying there is a helmet of salvation. <laughs> Go peace. So we'll pick up next Sunday on that. Don't allow the analogy, the metaphor, to dilute the truth that God's word has for us here. He has provided us everything that we need. There is nothing within us that can uh, cause the armor to fail because all the proponents of the armor God gives us at salvation, the truth is readily available. If we choose not to apply it, then it's sin on our part. It's not God's failure. And the uh, willing to obey the word of God, that starts when they're, we're little, new Christians. And uh, uh, try to reinforce that in believers, you know, that Obedience is not an option. It's not an option. You know, and uh, just because you don't feel like it, that doesn't excuse you. And that's basically the, the number one reason not to obey the word of God. I don't feel like it. You know, I'm not going to go share the gospel with that guy. He, he looks sinister. He might shoot me. He might stab me. Maybe, maybe he'll rob me. But, you know, in considering that if that was God's will for you, what a way to go as a martyr. I don't want to be stabbed, robbed, or shot, but uh, who am I to question God's will? See, we, we question God's will because it's not convenient for us. So, I'm not putting a guilt on you because we already have it on us as uh, believers, and I don't know, I've never really met any believer that was totally, 100% on board all the time. There's periods of time where we fail him by doubting him. We might not fail him in disobedience, but I think doubt is, falls into that category. Uh, but the shield of faith is something that the Bible says that we are to take up above all. So that's a necessary part. So what can I do to build my faith? Well, simply, 
The building stones for faith, obviously, is obedience. Trusting God, seeing how God provides, and growing going on from there. Next time you have an opportunity to see if you need to trust God, think about these things. Picture in your mind, standing there in front with your armor on, shiny and big plume coming out, you know, uh, breastplate of righteousness. It's the only time you're ever going to have a six-pack is when you wear this breastplate of righteousness and you know, show it off. And uh, that sword is as sharp as can be, you know. The Word of God is the only weapon that we need. It's not my opinion. It's not my ideas. It's the Word of God that is penetrates the hearts of folks that the wards, uh, the satanic attack, when Satan attacked Eve in the garden, he just kind of twisted things. He questioned God <coughs> and uh, questioned and put the doubt in her mind about whether God was sincere or not. And uh, that's, that's how he works today. So how do I protect myself? I fill my mind with the word of God and I act on it. Trusting him step by step. All right, let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity. I pray, Lord, that you would just lead and direct us. Help us, Father, to uh, just trust you totally. As we envelop our minds with the word of God, that we might just obey your word without thinking, just obedience. And I pray, Father, that you would give us opportunities to share the truth uh, with others in this world that we live by. Folks lost in their sins don't even know it, Father. Help us to be sensitive and um, loving and willing to go out of our way to share this gospel. Because we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, one more time together. And that hymn is. Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.